Well, like I said, we're moving through this preaching series called The Marks of the Church. And if you got a bulletin when you came in, it's got the cover on it, which says The Marks of the Church. And inside of the bulletin, there is a schedule of our preaching series. So you can uh, follow along and understand that we're looking at this passage from the book of Acts. We started this last week. Book of Acts is, of course, the uh, sort of sequel to what happens in the Gospels. It's the what happened next of the Gospels. Got a little picture of the book of Acts up there. And, you know, there's this moment where it says, well, what did the early church look like when they started gathering together? And what were the characteristics of the early church? Well, it says there were four characteristics. That they followed the apostles' teaching. That they followed fellowship. That they broke bread. And that they prayed. And they devoted themselves to these marks of the church, and people could see that this was what characterized their early ministry. Of course, what we were talking about last week is that this should be our ministry, too. These should be the same things that we devote ourselves to as we become the church, the body of Christ, the people of God. And so, as we move through this preaching series, we're going to take two weeks on each of these. So this is part one of the Apostles' Teaching. And it leads us to ask the question, well, what do we mean by the apostles' teaching? A lot of us know who the apostles are. What does it mean that the early church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching? Well, just to remind you, the apostles were the men and women who followed Jesus. You had the 12 disciples plus the other men and women that were part of the group. And then after Jesus died and resurrected, they became the apostles because they were sent out. And to be an apostle means to be a messenger. And they've been sent out to proclaim the good news. What is it, then, that the apostles are teaching? What are they talking about? And what would people ask them when they came along spreading their message? Well, let's remember this. Let's remember that they were living in a Greek context. Sometimes we forget about that, that the early church, these New Testament times, took place in a Greek context. If we go back to the previous slide, we're going to find a a map of the Mediterranean. And you can see that Jerusalem and Israel are down in the bottom right-hand corner, but right in the middle is Greece. And at that time, Greek influence and the Greek language and Greek culture had kind of spread and um, kind of colored the whole area, the way people talked, the way they conversed, the way they thought about themselves. And so when the apostles were talking about their vision and their mission, people would have asked them about their philosophy. Isn't that interesting that back then people talked about philosophy, people talked about worldview. This comes out of the Greek tradition. They didn't have TV, they didn't have uh, a lot of schools, but what they would do is they would say, oh, well, what do you think about the world? What's your philosophy? You know, depending on where you are, depending on what part of the country, people ask you different things. I was actually up in Georgia a little bit this past week, and somebody explained to me that there are different regions of Georgia, and people will ask you different things in Georgia depending on where you are. Are there any Georgia folks in the crowd today? Okay. So it was explained to me that if you're in Atlanta, they will ask you, what is your trade? What is your work? If you're in central Georgia, they'll ask you, what is your family name? And if you're in Savannah, they'll ask you, what would you like to drink? (laughs) Southern hospitality, right? So depending on where you are, people ask you different things. It turned out that the disciples, the apostles, in this kind of Mediterranean Greek culture, people would ask them, what's your philosophy? What's your outlook on life? What is, in your opinion, the meaning of all this? And the apostles, instead of dodging that question, would say, hold on a minute. Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about a person. Let me tell you about a life. Let me tell you about events that took place in Jerusalem. Let me tell you about a death. Let me tell you about a resurrection. Let me tell you about Jesus. Instead of answering the question, what is their philosophy, they would say, let me tell you about a person and a life. 
And so that is the bedrock of the apostles' teaching. You know, we wonder, did they have apostolic schools where people would gather together? No, what they had was conversations. And these conversations took the form of the apostles meeting people all around the Mediterranean area and saying, let me tell you about Jesus. That was the building block of the apostles' teaching. And so when we hear the early church devoted itself to the apostles' teaching, they devoted themselves to learning and talking about Jesus. But the next question, then, is if the basis of the apostles' teaching is what they said about Jesus, what did they say about Jesus? Because you and I both know that there is a lot to say. People have been writing and talking about Jesus for a long time, and lots has been said. What would the apostles have said about their teacher, their leader, their guide, their mentor, Jesus Christ. Remember, people have always wanted to attach themselves to somebody important. And when they talk about that important person, they often want to build them up. I'm actually going to need two volunteers to help me with an example right now. Let's see. Okay, one. And sure, two. So, Come on, right up here. Come on, right up here. And I was remembering that when I was a kid, you'd be arguing with people on the playground, and one of the things that you argued about was how great your parents were. And sometimes you'd say things like, oh, well, my mom is blank. And they would say, oh, yeah, well, my mom is blank. Or my dad is blank. And they'd say, oh, yeah, well, my dad is blank and try to one-up each other with how great your parents were, some kind of a funny thing to argue about. But I was wondering if you could help me dramatize this right now. Stand right there. <laughs> Put this one on so that you guys can talk into this. One, two. One, two. Here we go. Okay. My mom can fix anything. Oh yeah, well my dad can fly an airplane. Oh yeah, well my dad can fly an airplane. Oh yeah, my dad can swim five miles without even taking a breath. Oh yeah, my mom was in the Olympics. Oh yeah, my mom was in the Olympics. Oh, yeah, my mom invented Facebook. Oh. Oh, yeah, my dad invented the computer. Oh, yeah, my dad invented the computer. My, oh, yeah, my dad's a Tyrannosaurus Rex. <laughs> oh, yeah, my mom's the president of the world. Oh, yeah, my mom's the president of the world. Can give him a hand? Uh-huh, sure. Thank you all so much. You notice what they were doing is going back and forth and saying that their leader, their teacher, in this case their parent, was better than the other person's leader or teacher. And that was one of the things that might have happened in the apostles' days. You would argue about whose God was better than someone else's God. You would argue about whose teacher or mentor was better than somebody else's teacher or mentor. And you would kind of try to build them up and say, oh yeah, well my teacher did this, my teacher did this. For the apostles, they certainly could have talked about all of the healings, all of the miracles, all of the extraordinary teachings of Jesus' life. But let me ask you, what did they mainly say about Jesus when people asked them, who is this guide, leader, Jesus that you're talking about? Well, one of the things that they always said is that Jesus Christ was crucified. Wait a minute. I thought they were supposed to be building him up. But within the first sentence, if you look in the book of Acts, whenever they talked about Jesus, they always say, this Jesus who was crucified. What an interesting thing to lead with. You know, there's something called the Apostles' Creed, which was the basis for the Nicene Creed. Um, a very simple statement of faith was put together over the course of many years uh, out of different building blocks. One of the earliest building blocks was right in the middle, 
where it says, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, and then it goes down and says, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. One of the earliest pieces of the Apostles' Creed was to say, Jesus Christ was crucified, died, and was buried. Kind of a strange way to lead off, isn't it? Not really building him up, is it? Because crucifixion, as you will remember, was a death reserved for criminals, the worst of the worst. And kind of a strange thing to say, oh, we had this leader, and he was really great, and he was a terrific teacher, and he started a movement, he talked about the kingdom of God, and then he was hung out to dry, condemned by the Romans, condemned by the people of Jerusalem, and killed as a common criminal. Kind of a strange way to build him up. Jesus Christ crucified. And even in the gospel passage today, to come back to Jesus and Peter on the road in Caesarea Philippi, Jesus himself articulates the fact that his identity is based on his death. He says in the passage that we looked at today, the nation's leaders, the chief priests, and the choosers of the law will make the Son of Man suffer terribly. The disciples are upset about this, but Jesus says, this is who I am. When we talk about Jesus, we're going to talk about Christ crucified. How different is that than the idea of building somebody up? You know, I ran across a quote about Jesus' ministry. This is by a biblical scholar. And it says, Jesus was born as an apparently illegitimate child to an unmarried couple who were obscure members of a small nation on the outskirts of the Roman Empire. He lived in such obscurity that apart from the New Testament, we know very little about him although the Roman and Jewish historical references support the New Testament. His brief three-year public ministry ended apparently in complete failure, rejected by his people, betrayed by one of his disciples, deserted by the rest, condemned by Rome, and erased in the most shameful form of execution. His disciples were hardly the kind of people who you would expect to start a worldwide movement. They had no formal education, military might, or political clout. And here's the most important part, this movement should have evaporated like hundreds of other small religious sects. This movement should have evaporated like so many other movements in which the leader was raised up and then arrested, tried, and executed. Scholars maintain that there is not a strong reason for why the Jesus movement should have continued and succeeded when he was killed and tried as a criminal. You know, even in the Old Testament, it says, cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. Cursed is anyone who is killed hanging from a tree. Jesus was not only hung from a tree, he was nailed to one. Tried as a common criminal, humiliated, embarrassed, and deserted. And yet, this is the element which the apostles make as their building block to say, oh, let me tell you about Jesus. You want to know about Jesus? He was crucified. Jesus Christ, our teacher, our leader, our guide, was killed. Why, oh why, do they lead with this, this curse? Well, because we know it's not the end of the story, right? And in this verse, oh, sorry, go back to that first passage. In this verse, we see at the end, he will be rejected and killed, but three days later, he will rise to life. We know that the crucifixion, Christ crucified, is not the end of the story. It's only half of the story, isn't it? And so when the apostles proclaimed Jesus, they proclaimed Christ crucified and raised. Christ crucified and raised. When people asked them about Jesus, they said, we proclaim Christ crucified and raised. And what does that do to the story? Well, it flips it, doesn't it? It flips it over. It exchanges the shame of the crucifixion for the glory of the resurrection. It takes the worst thing possible and flips it over into the best thing possible. I have another quote from a biblical scholar talking about other stories in antiquity. Uh, this scholar says, In Jesus' death and resurrection, we have the great anti-tragedy. You see, in all the tragic dramas of antiquity, we detect the same pattern. The hero, be he Alexander or Oedipus, reaches his pinnacle only to be cut down. 
But in the drama of Jesus, do we have the opposite pattern? The hero is cut down only to be raised up. To exchange shame for joy. To take the worst thing possible and turn it into the best thing possible. We're jumping ahead a little bit, but do you have any shame in your life? Do we have any shame in our lives? And what would happen if someone came to us and said, I'll take that shame, I'll take that shame, and I will give back to you joy and glory? What would happen if they said, I'll take that shame, and I'll give back to you joy and glory? This is what the apostles proclaimed as they talked about Jesus. They said, Jesus, crucified and raised, has the power of transformation to transform people's lives, and to transform the world. And so when we talk about the apostles' teaching, we talk about the apostles telling people about Jesus. And when we talk about what they said about Jesus, they said, crucified and raised. Crucified and raised because he represents a God of transformation, a God who can turn shame into joy and glory. That is the bedrock, that is the building block of what we do as a church. Jesus Christ, crucified and raised, Jesus Christ, transformer. All of our other ethics, all of our other traditions, all of our liturgy, all of our teaching, it is for naught if we don't focus on that first building block of who is Jesus, crucified and raised. I heard a place about a place called... uh, the cathedral in Canterbury, Canterbury Cathedral. It's one of the largest and most beautiful cathedrals in the whole world. It is one of the most important churches in the Anglican Communion because they have the dean of the cathedral, but then they also have the Archbishop of Canterbury who resides there. And the Archbishop of Canterbury, I suppose, is the most important Anglican in the whole world. And at this church, they have lots of Bible studies and they have beautiful music and full choirs. And they have extraordinary stained glass windows and extraordinary architecture, and there are very learned people that go to Canterbury in England. And do you want to know what the mission statement of this church is? What is the mission statement of the Canterbury Cathedral? Because it could be anything. It could be beautiful, flowery mission statement about proclaiming the good news and social justice and reflecting on the teachings of the church and healing and transforming and loving and all of these beautiful things that we put into mission statements. But I wonder what is the mission statement of the Canterbury Cathedral? You can find it on its website. If you go there and pick up a bulletin, it'll be right on the front. The mission statement of the cathedral in Canterbury, it's the same mission statement built by the apostles and the apostles' teaching, going all the way back to the early marks of the church, to show people Jesus. I couldn't have said it better myself. Amen.